Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns, Executive Director of the University Innovation Alliance. And I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. Each week, I team up with a journalist to have a conversation with typically a sitting college president or chancellor. Today, it's going to be a bit different. We're going to actually think more about statewide leadership. But in general, the purpose of Start the Week with Wisdom is to give you some perspective about leadership, wisdom, and ideally a little bit of hope for the week ahead. And that's why we call it Start the Week with Wisdom. And as Bridget said, we're going to come at things from a slightly different angle this week uh, and, and talk to somebody who's very involved in, in overseeing and working with higher education from the state level. Uh, we're pleased to interview uh, Dr. Lande Ajose, uh, uh, who's Senior Policy Advisor for Higher Education uh, for California Governor Gavin Newsom. Before she joined the Newsom administration, she was executive director of California Competes, uh, a nonprofit group in California. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. We're super excited to have you on. And so we usually start uh, just kind of setting the, the table with folks and uh, ask them kind of how you're holding up right now. Uh, well, you know, I got my COVID vaccine two weeks ago, so I'm holding up much better than I was beforehand. <laughs> it helps when you're, you know, when you get to be over 50 and slide in there with all those other people. So okay. hopefully you didn't have uh, too bad of uh, side effects. I 24 hours and then I was fine. So I, th I think that's like the new conversation, you know, the when people are like, how are this, how's this affecting you? It's, it's the, which one did you get? Did you have any uh, interactions? That's like every single conversation I have generally <laughs> goes pretty like much. It's how it goes. <laughs> okay. um, so uh, for folks at home uh, who are, aren't familiar with your body of work and more importantly don't see don't understand kind of where you sit in the landscape in california can you kind of explain how you introduce yourself to like a person on the street or a family member so that people understand kind of what does it mean to be in this particular role well you know when i'm being cheeky i say i get to be the governor of higher ed for the state of california um but i try not to be cheeky too often because then people take you seriously um but <laughs> what i mostly say is i have the privilege of helping the governor to think about from his perch what we can do to shape the like, ecosystem of higher education in the state um you know we have a very interesting um, massive higher education system in California with the UC, the CSUs, and the community colleges. And what that really means for us is that um, each of those entities operate somewhat independently. And what we're trying to do is make sure that they see themselves as puzzle pieces that fit together so that the student experience is a coherent and cohesive one and not just one where each institution is kind of doing its own thing. So we try to figure out what are the policies, practices, budget, priorities that we can put in place that really help to to forge those puzzle pieces into a coherent whole. California has a, a tremendous history of statewide coordination over higher education or with higher education going back to the master plan. It's had less uh, oversight in recent years because of some changes in the elimination of the coordinating you know, council that the body had, uh, the coordinating body that the state had. How would you sort of assess the where California is in getting that ecosystem and especially when you throw in private institutions it's a huge it's a massive ecosystem and, and a massive set of students how would you assess the sort of where you are on that continuum yeah it's a great question you know it's interesting because the master plan for higher education is really what California is known for and so people always harken back to this document in the 1960s and I said we have a little bit of a tendency to see the master plan like it's the Torah or the Bible it's mm -hmm. neither of those it was a contract between some individuals you know individual institutions um, and one of the challenges with the master plan is that while it was brilliant in so many ways it never accounted for how we were gonna finance this massive higher education system. And so what we very quickly found is as we had scads more people coming into higher ed, the, the system was somewhat broken because we didn't have a way to really support it. Um, oftentimes people think, oh, you know, we had so many more people coming into higher ed because, you know, we had immigrants coming from different places. Actually, 
it was all driven by women who decided to go to college, mm -hmm. right? And no one would deny them the opportunity now. So, you know, when we start to get into the, well, who has, who should have access question, I always remind people, this is not about, you know, winners and losers and who's, who's more deserving. Everyone's deserving of higher ed in this state. And it's incumbent upon us as a state to figure out how to, how to solve for that. Um, in the wake of, you know, the, the master plan, what we've now done is we have a council for post-secondary education, which brings together the leaders of the community college system, the CSU, the UC, our independent institutions, as well as business and civic leaders and some folks from government to really think about how can we more effectively ensure that we're thinking about and asking the big questions and doing some forward planning. It's advisory only to the governor. So we think about things like capacity. We think about things like innovation. And most recently, we thought about things like equity and what that means for the future of the state. Well, let's, uh, let's go there because I, uh, when I think one of our earlier conversations, uh, you let me know that the, you were thinking about really how, how California can emerge from the pandemic in, a, in actually a more equitable state. Are there, were there any strategic decisions that the state could make um, that, you know, because we were making a million decisions a minute across the country and, and those were all pretty reactionary, but you, it, it occurred to you to come up with a way to be strategic about those. And so I just want to set the table for folks to understand kind of how California has done something very different than I've seen in any other state during the, during COVID. And um, can you explain what the Recovery with Equity Task Force was, what gave you the idea, and uh, just kind of what what you saw happen? Well, it was about a year ago, right? It was April of last year. We were meeting with our council. We were hearing from the community colleges, the CSU, the UC, the, the independents about this enormous pivot from in-person instruction to everybody going online. And, you know, everyone was in crisis. There was just this place where we were thinking about triage. And I was talking to a colleague and we said, you know, at some point the triage period will be over the shock of this, you know, this this um, pandemic will be over, and we will be at a point where we recover. And what we actually need to be planning for is that moment, even though we can't really see it right now. And how do we plan for that moment in a way that is fundamentally about our values related to equity? Um, and so we said, let's do a task force, and let's see what if we can pull together the most brilliant minds that we know around educational innovation, around equity, around higher education in the state of California and beyond. What would they tell us to do? Which was why we were very grateful to have you on that task force, Bridget, as well as several other leaders, both nationally and in the state. And we met for the better part of six months and really started to think through, you know, if we decided that higher education equity didn't need to look the way it looked in January 2020, what could it look like? And what would be the steps that we would need to take as a state and as institutions to get there? And that's really where the task force um, was born. And it was a, for, for me, as it was a professional highlight, really being able to sit around the table, the virtual table with all of these colleagues uh, for six months to really think about how do we get higher education to live into our values? That's great. And I, I told you at the time that it was probably the, it, it definitely aligned with how visionary people perceive California's master plan, whether it's actually, you know, updated or not. But this movement was one of the most aligned things I've seen coming out of California in terms of forecasting, putting out a vision that other states should replicate um, and figuring out how you could benefit from what was known in the field. And I, and I think what was really important was identifying what questions you should be asking yourself, because I think a lot of states it's about, again, survival, triage, and they're not necessarily asking themselves the most strategic questions that position themselves and their citizens for 10 years, 20 years out. So that's my little plug for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, I appreciate that. And I think one of the things, you know, to that point that we really tried to think about was, uh, for example, what's the appropriate role of technology? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not as simple as we just need more online courses, but how can we, Marshall technology to make sure that we're improving the student experience and helping students, you know, learn and grow. What? How do we think about the real, the huge question of basic needs and affordability? So we were able to kind of, you know, lean into these really um, juicy questions and really think through what does that mean for students and our institutions. And you know, we have some big 
ideas in there. Um, and they're not easy to accomplish, but I think they they point to the right issues that the state needs to be grappling with, that our institutions need to be grappling with, and most importantly, that our students deserve answers to, right? And so for me, the imperative was, we have millions of students in the state who we are valiantly trying to make sure all have their A through G requirements and all have access to college, and access to college is nothing but a failed promise if we're not actually delivering on the opportunity to attend. And that's what that task force was about. It was making sure that all those kids from across the state who don't have college knowledge in their house still have an opportunity to go to college and to be successful in the state. There was probably a lot of assumption at the time you were talking, and I think a lot of people are still assuming that the period when you would, the, the recovery would start with a lot of institutions and probably a lot of states in, pretty dreadful financial situations. And actually, I mean, at least, I mean, judging by the California budget, which was sort of surprisingly positive uh, from our national perspective, and then what has been a pretty supportive to higher education flow of money from the federal government, it, it, a lot of institutions, and uh, you may be trying to carry out some of the stuff you're trying to do in maybe better financial shape than you might've feared or expected six or a months or a year ago. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we went into, um, I remember we had a very ambitious uh, budget for 2020, 2021. And by the time we got to signing that budget, uh, June 30th, we had a $54 billion deficit. We all took, I mean, this that we all got whacked basically. So it was really rough. And, you know, the task force started a month later. Um, and so we didn't know what we were going to have in terms of resources to support, but it kind of didn't matter. Because when we were thinking about recovery, we weren't just thinking about the immediate recovery. We were really, you know, to Bridget's point, trying to forecast out what's the next trajectory for this higher education system? And how do we build into that? How do we think about where we need to be by 2030 and make decisions now to put us on the course for being there by 2030. And we have been, um, you know, we have a, a ton right now of, of resources, thank to the Biden administration um, and some, you know, significant resources for higher education. Now the question is, a lot of that's one-time money. So how do you expend those one-time resources wisely when we know we have students who don't go to school, generally speaking, for one year? They go for two, they go for four, but it's not, it's a one-year commitment in terms of those resources and we're very disciplined about not overspending. So so, but so then it come, probably leads you to questions of whether you plug holes or start to invest in some of those ways that will have longer term effects. And, and, and there's probably a push and a pull tension there's there, a, I'm guessing. That was my that was the call that I had right before I hopped on here, which was how do we think about, you know, marshalling these resources in ways that both meet immediate need, um, but also allow us to plan for the future. Um, and knowing that there are constraints about when and how you can spend spend those resources. I know that institutions are hopeful that there will be additional resources coming from the federal government. And perhaps one thing that would be useful for that is if we heard, you know, examples of how people have any creative ways that people have used those resources. Um, is there any one use that for you stands out as being one that like really impacted the lives of students? Um, I know that that's something that, that would be valuable for folks to share more about. Um, well, one thing that we did um, because of the pandemic is the governor decided that he wanted to put forward what he called uh, an immediate action package. Um, so rather than just doing a final budget in June, that he wanted to pass part of that budget early in the year, and we passed it in February. And in that immediate action package, he actually set aside a hundred million dollars for student emergency uh, student emergency funds um, because students are just very very much in need. Um, there was a, a piece that came out this morning that talked about just the incredible drops in enrollment that we've seen, um, really counterintuitively, um, particularly in our community colleges, some community colleges in our rural regions off by as much as fifty percent enrollment. Um, and so really thinking about what are the resources that we can set aside for those students because so much of their issue is affordability to pull them back in um, and to be able to provide them with some funds so that they can afford to go to school. Um, we also then um, allocated about $20 million for the systems to think about in how they can innovate around keeping in touch with those students who have left and pulling them in. So one piece is just for 
you know, cash for kids, right? There's another piece that is really about how do we build an infrastructure so that we can continue to do that kind of outreach and really reach those people who have left for some reason, who are the most uh, in the most need for higher education, who we need to bring back. Um, there's been a lot of focus on learning loss at the K-12 level. This is in some ways the equivalent at the higher education level, but rather than learning loss, loss we just have people stopping out or dropping out and we need to bring them back. And that is our job. It is not just for them to kind of uh, find the moment when they're able to come. It is our job to find a, a path for them to come in. I'm, I'm curious in the time you've spent in state policy, I've heard more and more state policy people talk about, there's a lot of talk within higher education about silos. It's clear that that higher education is one piece of a puzzle and, and the stuff that's under the domain of somebody like you is is only one part of the puzzle for students. And I'm curious what you've seen about trying to get different parts of the state government working together on housing and food insecurity and other things. And so, and, and I've, no, I've talked to people in different states about how challenging that can be. I'm curious how, how you see that unfolding in California, whether you see a pathway to greater intera interactivity, interaction between different parts of the government that might benefit students in, to some extent. Well, I feel fortunate insofar as um, this actually is a priority of the governor's. Uh, before he was governor, he wrote a book called Citizenville, which was really about how government can better serve its residents. And um, that book really talked about the effectiveness of government itself, right? And so one um, aspect of that is it's given us some license to really think about how are we doing our work effectively. Um, and so now, I, you know, one of the ideas that we've been thinking about is, is there a way, for example, to look at our state income tax form, allow residents to check a box that might then give them some early information about what they would be eligible for in terms of state financial aid? right? So that you could do that if your kid is a sophomore in high school and begin to think and do some of that planning. Are there ways to make government more effective in, the, in, that, um, in that way? One of the recommendations that came out of our report, the Recovery with Equity report, was thinking about how we can use um, uh, data and information better. Uh, one of the things that bugs me is we have all these kids who are on free and reduced lunch when they're in high school. Then they go to college and their food insecure. And we wonder, huh, how did that happen? Well, actually, we have information on them. And we should be able to make use of that information without violating any FERPA laws or privacy laws. How can we make use of that information to make sure that those kids aren't food and housing insecure when they go to college, right? So those are the things around government effectiveness and efficiency that we're trying to lean into. How do we make sure that we're getting students pre-enrolled in CalFresh? Is there any kind of auto enrollment that we can do um, mm -hmm. so that students have access to resources for which they are eligible and entitled, right? So those are the kinds of things that we're really trying to work on um, that is about planning for the future and making the state and the um, state government operate more effectively to serve residents. That's great. And I um, I would definitely encourage folks to consider reading the Recovery with Equity report. It's a great, I think, roadmap for the types of issues you should be including in conversations that I don't think most states naturally are going to talk about. And I'm going to weave in um, one question that we just got from the audience, which was specifically around for students who have limited access to technology. Um, yeah, and this is something, you know, how do we actually make sure that we're not widening that gap um, if we're now going to be using more technology. And I know this is something that the RWE group really wrestled with in terms of the digital divide. And I thought, you know, not only can you share a little bit about what you found interesting in their conclusions or the recommendation, but if you're advising another state who's going to actually toy with this, like, this exact question, um, is there anything that you learned from this process or any suggestions that you would offer that you think would make it, um, or at least let them know what you learned from it? Yeah. So digital equity is a very specific recommendation within the Recovery with Equity report. We have a, a whole recommendation on that. And there's no doubt that California has digital deserts, both in regional, uh, in 
rural areas across the state, as well as in many of our urban areas, right? Where there are deserts and just pockets of places that have no connectivity. Uh, and we found two things over the course of the study. One is we found students who didn't have access to the appropriate devices. And we had an all out effort and raised millions and millions of dollars to get, I don't know, I think we had uh, about 800 uh, million devices that we needed to provide to different Californians. So we spent a lot of time and effort and money trying to raise both, uh, you know, fundraise because this was again happening during uh, our our budget deficit. Um, but then in addition, we spent a lot of time trying to navigate and negotiate with folks who ran these uh, internet companies and looking at internet service providers, not only to have them uh, provide low cost programs to our means tested students, right? Um, uh, they were quite willing to do so for, for students in K-12. We had a little bit more resistance for students who were in, um, in higher ed and we're really still continuing to work on that. How can we make sure that higher ed students who are Cal Grant recipients, Pell Grant recipients are getting access to those low cost programs from their internet service providers. But on top of that, to make sure that the internet service providers are providing sufficient bandwidth, because we found a lot of students who didn't have enough bandwidth to be able to do their Zoom courses. And that's that classic picture that you see of students sitting outside of a Taco Bell, right? Trying to do their homework or be on Zoom class with a, with a fake background. Um, so we really need to be attentive to all of those things. Um, we're really hoping to take advantage of some of this one-time money to uh, make sure that we wire the state of California that never again do we wanna look back on the state of California and realize we don't have um, everyone in the state with um, some kind of access to, to the internet because it is now a working part of how we all live. And if you don't have access, you can't really participate um, in, you can't really participate civically in our culture without the uh, internet access. So. That's really helpful, and, and I because I know that a lot of states are having conversations identifying problems, but the fact that you actually convened a, a, a real cross section of professionals from a variety of vantage points to actually figure out what you could do about it. That's the difference. And that's what I want to encourage folks who are at home. If your state, yes, everyone's talking about the digital divide, but what are they actually going to do about it? It's not natural that solutions are going to just generally, you know, pop up in the midst of a state budget process or a state legislative process. And beyond thinking bill by bill, really thinking about what is the, what, like, how do you be the most like strategic state you can. Um, I do want to ask generally, what what did you learn? Uh, I, I, I'm curious about what struck you that was the most personally impactful part of going through this RWE process um, as, as you were thinking about hoping other states kind of borrow this path or replicate what California is doing. What for you, you think was the most like high, high value experience? Um, one of the most high value experience, quite frankly, for us was um, making sure that we included on that recovery with equity task force folks from outside of the state. Um, one of the, the advantages of being California is that we have a vast higher education system. We have a lot of expertise here. And so we actually tend to talk to ourselves a lot. And um, I think it's important to actually make sure you're drawing ideas from other people in other places who can really push your thinking. And that was a really, really important, I think, design principle for us is that we pulled in people from, from other states. The other design principle that I thought was really important was to have representation from all of the higher education segments, um, but not to, uh, but to also make sure that there were people who were going to push those segments to think and act differently. So we had former students, uh, student leaders on that group. We had um, advocacy organizations that were in the room. Uh, we had faculty members from different institutions. We had college presidents as well as you know uh, segment leaders. So it was a really diverse group. And given all of that diversity, there was no uh, guarantee that we were all going to agree. And sometimes we didn't. But there was vastly more that we agreed on than we disagreed on. And I think that's what led us to, you know, the really impactful uh, 11 recommendations that we have in the report. That's wonderful. Well, I think that's 
the perfect way to end this conversation is uh, encouraging other folks, other states to replicate what California has done. And I um, will try and put the link below each of these videos on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Periscope. Uh, so folks can actually review the report and see what kind of recommendations. Um, I would love to see every state engage in this kind of strategic thinking. And, you know, I think it would best position the state or best position the country in terms of recovery with equity. If we had states actually, you know, amplifying what the unique uh, solutions needed in their state were, because I expect there would be a, a wide degree of variance. But right now uh, we just have one example. So that's our leadership tip for the week, <laughs> encouraging states to start thinking about this. So um, thank you, Londe. This has been really useful and it's just so wonderful to um, continue to get a chance to work with you. And thanks for um, sharing a bit about this and hopefully nudging other states to think more about the future needs of their students. And Doug, as always, it's just um, continues to be a delight. Pleasure. Yep. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Bridget. Bet. Lovely to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Londe.